Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I am Niklas. I'm a mathematics PhD student at EPFL in the first year in the Mathematics for Materials Modeling Group with Professor Michael Herbst. Um, right, let, let's get into it. Physics informed automatic differentiation. What is it? Um, quick disclaimer in the beginning. Uh, for, for this talk, since I have only 10 minutes, I thought I would basically skip all the math and just show code and pictures. But if you're interested in the details of any of this, there's like a lot of interesting math behind it and a lot of interesting programming questions too. Like, do get in touch, let's talk about this. And there's also the hackathon on Thursday. Let's, let's uh, get into it. Right, uh, physics informed differentiable programming, PDE, there's like many of these terms uh, floating around. Um, I see it roughly as an umbrella term of a combination of you use automatic differentiation you want to use scientific models that uh, use partial differential equations, potentially very complicated, and uh, you want to, you have to use numerical methods because there's no other way uh, of dealing with partial differential equations. So, uh, and then if you can use, if you can get derivatives through such methods, uh, these are of course uh, interesting for many applications. There's many talks about this here at JulieCon. I'm sure you know inverse problems, uncertainty propagation, there's optimization, a lot of different stuff you can do with it. Um, right. So the key ingredient is this derivative. And it's not, it's not such a trivial thing. Um, so the question is, how do, you, how do you get such a derivative, right? Um, since physics informed is in the title, and we do work on DFT, density function theory, in solid state physics in particular, uh, I want to start with a physics example. Here's a lithium crystal, as you might find it in a lab, um, freshly cut. Uh, let's skip to the atomistic view. This would be uh, a perfect crystal. An idealization would be such a periodic arrangement of atoms. This is what's called the body-centered cubic crystal formation. And each of those would be a lithium atom. The bonds here are just for illustration. Um, it's not. It's not really computed like a graph. Um, and you would set periodic boundary conditions to uh, get away from like surface effects. All right, a very uh, a, a comic way to think about uh, density function theory um, as a complicated PDE, there's some kind of physical parameters uh, for a given structure. There's the structure itself, then there's physical parameters, and these together uh, somehow make up the environment in which the PDE is solved. And this determines the solution of the PDE, in this case, rho. And then from that solution, you might either look at it, but usually then you're post-processing that solution and computing some kind of uh, observables. Um, in DFT, for example, um, so we are interested in the dense, total density of electrons and then uh, quantities of interest might be energies, forces, band gaps, stuff that gets you closer to something you can uh, you can measure at a large scale, basically. Um, right. So there's some of these parameters that are interesting for inverse problems, for example, are first of all the arrangement of the atoms of the nuclei. This would be the lattice and the uh, positions of the atoms, but also what their type is. Um, and this would be, for example, to do geometry optimization to find the ground state, to even determine that such a crystal would be the minimum energy configuration. Um, but there's also other uh, two other kinds of that come to mind. First, one of them is pseudopotentials. It's a very interesting topic, and I'm actually currently working on it, but I don't have time to go into detail here. And another one is uh, the exchange correlation functional, um, yes. But last but not least, there's also numerical parameters, right? You have to choose your grid size and the tolerances of your iterative solver. And you also have to choose in what kind of arithmetic you're solving this, right? How many bits are you using and so on. And so these, can, these two are kind of always uh, uh, clashing with, the, with each other, which is why numerical analysis is so interesting. Right, uh, in code, so what I'm doing here, I'm loading uh, uh, the physical system here from a file. 
Um, that gives me a cell, cell consider, uh, cons consisting of a lattice, uh, atoms, and positions. In this case, there's just a single atom, and the lattice is a 3x3 three three matrix describing the periodicity. Right, looks like this. There's a 3x3 three three matrix uh, describing the periodic arrangement. Um, there's just a single atom, which is lithium, and its position is at zero. Uh, then you, what we do here is we create a supercell that would look like two atoms with periodic boundary conditions and then we choose a bunch of numerical parameters here. Uh, one I will talk a bit, uh, I will show examples with uh, increasing the energy cutoff in particular, which you can think of a grid spacing parameter, uh, very high level. Right. Uh, then, once we have our system, this is a forward model uh, that would solve such a system, giving these parameters, it would do a bunch of setup stuff and uh, choose a discretization and so on, and then call the self-consistent field method, which solves for the solution of the PDE, so fixed point method. Good. Solve, converges very quickly, very good. This is very coarse parameters. This is what a slice of this three-dimensional electron density would look like. And you would see how there's two atoms and it's periodic copies. That's the rest you see. All right, uh, I spend way too much time uh, on this, but I think it's important to get a setting first. Uh, implicit differentiation would now mean that we want to solve for derivatives through such a process, but not by differentiating the process itself at least not the numerical one, we want to differentiate the physical process, right? We want to differentiate the equation. So that means solving for the derivative is itself a numerical problem that should be controlled. Um, all right. So what I'm doing here is I'm uh, wrapping, uh, I'm doing what I did before, I'm solving for the SAF. And then I'm doing some post-processing on the solution to compute a quantity of interest. And uh, these are the forces uh, on, the fir on, on the atoms. And this is I'm doing by forward diff. And forward diff is what we currently support in the package. But most of what I'm saying in this talk would also apply to reverse differentiation. Um, and even the solver that is at the heart of this is the same solver for both cases because it's a self-adjoint system. Um, yes. So what I'm, sorry, two more minutes. Um, I will, I, so basically what happens before you perturb the system in its symmetric uh, phase, it does not have any forces on the atoms. When you perturb the atoms a little bit, you do get forces. This is what you see here, and this in the background uses this generic autodiff solver, which is very cool. Um, now, since I only have two minutes left, I would rather uh, jump directly to the slider, which is why this is a Pluto notebook. <laughs> um, and what I'm doing here, I first solve it on a very coarse grid, where I say the <coughs> energy cutoff is just five, and that means it's a very pixelated image of the density. But what I'm also showing here is, I'm also showing that derivative of the density with respect to the parameter in the PDE. And now I can increase the discretization parameter and each time solve again what the correct uh, notion or what the, what the correct form uh, is of this gradient. And just by playing by this plot, this is kind of the point, high level point I wanted to make. Um, Derivatives themselves of PDEs might have complicated structure, and here you see it looks as this one is even a bit more complicated than the original density itself. So it's something to think about. And whether this matters for your application or not is then also uh, an interesting question. Um, with that, uh, there's a bunch of more stuff I could uh, show, but just talk to me about it. There's something interesting with crystal symmetries and symmetry breaking, and there's very subtle bugs one can have, um, and there's also clear ways to avoid it. Uh, tomorrow, there's the five years of DFTK talk by Michael, which is uh, a longer talk, and 
there will be much more details than here. And there's a bunch of interesting further reading. And I acknowledge all the DFTK contributors, all the Julia package authors, and all of you, the community. Um, that thank you very much. <laughs>